The members of the IBEW Local 1245 are legally protected by contracts with over 270 companies with wages and benefits that lead the utility industry. But how did they achieve this power? This is the story of workers challenging their employers, of labor's ongoing struggle to organize in a fight for better wages, safer working conditions, secure employment, and in short, a better world. In the early days of electric power, people compared its mysterious qualities to magic. Investors saw new ways to make money, but the workers who climbed the poles just found new ways to die. One utility executive with 20 years in the industry said he only knew one lineman who died of natural causes. In fact, so many linemen died on the job that insurance companies refused to insure them. In 1891, Linemen and electricians meeting in St. Louis established the International Brotherhood of Electrical Workers, the IBEW. They wanted to create a death benefit so that their widows could afford to bury them. The union's first president, Henry Miller, died penniless at 38 after being electrocuted and falling from a pole. Electricity was first generated for commercial use in California in 1879. It powered gold and silver mines, lit up the famous Palace Hotel, and gave rise to a sprawling utility industry. In San Francisco, the IBEW chartered Electrical Workers Local 6 to represent the construction electricians who wired new buildings. Local 6 was affiliated with the San Francisco Building Trades Council, headed by Patrick Henry McCarthy. McCarthy had no interest in organizing the pole stickers at electric utilities, leaving linemen with no one to represent them. In 1900, employers from Los Angeles tried to recruit these San Francisco linemen to replace Los Angeles linemen who were on strike. The strikers urged the linemen to honor the strike and stay away from LA. The San Francisco linemen gathered at a lecture hall and decided they would not work as strike breakers in Los Angeles. They also decided to form their own union and obtained a charter from the IBEW to organize Local 151. Within weeks, IBEW Local 151 went on strike at several San Francisco utilities. Union President David Keith said, it is a matter of life and death with us. By refusing to work until their concerns were addressed, the San Francisco utility linemen won the eight-hour day and time and a half for overtime. It was the first written labor agreement in the history of the IBEW. Following the lead of Local 151, workers organized at several San Francisco gas companies and negotiated a wage standard that applied to all gas workers. IBEW 151 wanted to negotiate a wage standard for all linemen, no matter what company they worked for. Their biggest obstacle was United Railroads and its president, Patrick Calhoun. In 1906, United Railroads controlled many of San Francisco's streetcars. Calhoun wanted to convert the streetcar system into a more profitable overhead trolley system. Calhoun's chief corporate counsel secretly gave $200,000 to a political fixer to bribe city supervisors into approving the overhead trolley system. The home of the brave, the land of the free, I don't want to be mistreated by no bourgeoisie. Lord. Some civic leaders objected that Calhoun was simply trying to squeeze money out of San Francisco to benefit his East Coast cronies. I got some bourgeois blues, I'm gonna spread the news all around. When the 1906 San Francisco earthquake hit, everyone's attention shifted to rebuilding the ruined city. 28,000 buildings had been destroyed and nearly a quarter million people were left homeless. With the streetcar system in a shambles and with supervisors awash in bribe money, Calhoun's overhead trolley proposal passed unanimously. To keep this new corporate gravy train on track, United Railroads needed its linemen more than ever. But linemen weren't happy with United Railroads. The company required them to work 10-hour days, while linemen at San Francisco Gas and Electric worked shorter hours for more pay. In July of 1906, IBEW Local 151 took the linemen at United Railroads out on strike. 
The union demanded both a raise and a closed shop, meaning only union members could be hired. Calhoun saw this as a power grab, which of course it was. The linemen wanted more say over wages, safety, and other conditions of work. Calhoun hired James Farley, a notorious strike breaker, who recruited scabs to run the streetcars and to intimidate the strikers. One newspaper called Farley, a man who prefers hot blood to water as a beverage. Farley once made $300,000 for a single assignment and claimed to have broken 50 strikes in a row. To put down the United Railroad strikers, Farley hired 2,500 scabs from New York and armed them with 38s. The New York Times called it the first detachment of the biggest army of strikebreakers ever moved in this country for a battle between labor and capital. But the strikers were mobilizing too. H.L. Worthington, an IBEW officer and leader of the strike committee, knew the linemen weren't strong enough to win the strike by themselves. But they might succeed if all the workers at United Railroads walked out. Streetcarmen, track layers, and others also had to work long hours without overtime pay. Worthington persuaded six of these other unions to join the strike. This strategy of uniting all the company's workers for greater leverage was called industrial unionism. Faced with a united workforce, company president Calhoun backed down and accepted binding arbitration, meaning that a neutral third party would help settle the dispute. The arbitration panel awarded electric workers virtually everything they demanded. And all of the unions at United Railroads were granted the eight-hour day, except for the streetcarmen. Very soon, the linemen and streetcarmen would join forces again in one of the bloodiest strikes in the city's history. Noah, Noah, let me come in. Doors all locked and the window pinned. Keep your hand on my cloud. Oh, oh, oh. Men have fought 